Is it true that you made a song with your sixth grade teacher, Mr. Swain? What are you, Narwar? <laughs> Here we go. Oh my God. You just blew my mind, fam. Um, Mr. Swain. I can't wait till he sees this. Yeah, it was my science teacher. He was really into rap, and he was into the fact that I rapped, and I was his student aide, so I had a whole period where I would come and help him grade papers, but really we would just chop it up. He was cool as hell. Um, wow. You just brought a smile to my face, brother. <laughs> you just warmed my soul up. What's the most harrowing experience you had as a young man and member of an underground New York City poker club? Like, did you ever see? <laughs> oh my God, how do you know about this stuff? <laughs> did you ever see? You're well researched. <clears throat> Thank did you, Did we play together? No, no, oh, no. Okay. I, I, I wish, I wish. So like stand-up comedians, the wrestling origin story is something that we obsess about on this show. What do you remember about performing under the name Commando in a league called Central Illinois Wrestling? Wow. Man, a lot. You've done some homework, brother. <laughs> I'll give you this. You're the first person that's ever asked me that question. Kudos to you, because I've answered a lot of the same questions. Over the last year, I'll, I've answered the same question a lot, so good for you. Um, so starving to death, I was making absolutely no money. I look back on those experiences and those times really fondly and never forgot them because it was a struggle. You know, because a lot of times guys get up to the show, they make a little, you know, they get a little scratch and, you know, they're, they're, they change, completely change. So I'm very interested in the chapter of your life before comedy when you were training to be a painter and you were selling t-shirts with your acrylic portraits printed on them from a folding table on the corner of Print Street in Wooster. Yeah. What's the most memorable transaction that you ever made on the sidewalk there? Oh man, I met so many people. I met um, Conan O'Brien, Billy Crystal. I met uh, Tommy Hilfiger. I met... Andre 3000? Andre 3000, how'd you know that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I met Andre 3000. He bought a he bought a little like Jimi Hendrix shirt from me. I, I painted a Jimi Hendrix shirt. Oh man, yeah, that's great. All I've ever wanted was to be a bad guy wrestler, and these people genuinely hated me. It was fantastic. Yeah, you used to watch wrestling with your grandfather, right? How the fuck did you know that? Yes, yeah, he couldn't have told you. He's been dead for ten years. But no, yeah, I used to watch it. I think like. It's how I learned how to talk, honestly. I know that you have a deep connection to scary movies. It's a hobby that began when you were a child. Yes. And then it's grown into you co-founding Spectrovision in 2010, a production company that focuses on horror movies. Mm -hmm. What can you tell people about Truth or Dare, A Critical Madness? Oh, <laughs> sir, you've done your research. Um, Truth or Dare, A Critical Madness. It's one of the first horror movies I remember seeing. It's a great, the movie is about a guy who, who's uh, at the very beginning of the movie, he catches his wife sleeping with his best friend uh, and colleague. Um, and then he, he freaks out, has a, a pretty traumatic reaction to it and leaves in a huff. Uh, and then he goes on this road trip and loses his mind and he, he uh, picks up a hitchhiker. And she says, would you like to play Truth or Dare? And he's like, yeah, okay, Truth or Dare, all right. Play Truth or Dare. And it goes from like, throw your wallet in the fire, you know? Uh, Pretty intense thing, but all right, he's, you know, he's on this journey to cut your tongue out. It's sublime. It's so great. The performances are, are not good. Which was a more nerve-wracking on-set experience? The on-stage thong scene and Magic Mike are petting a live tiger in gold? Ah, that's a great question. <laughs> I gotta go with Magic Mike because somebody Somebody's hand when I was down there went a little far, and I and I was like, "Whoop! This is about to be it." And I, I, I snuck out of there. <laughs> I snuck out of there just in time to come out as covered as I could be. So your latest film, Stillwater, recently premiered to a five-minute long standing ovation at Con, and in it you play an oil roughneck from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. How did taking a road trip to the Sooner State, eating at places like Ray's Barbecue, and then befriending real-life oil man Kenny Baker, how did that help you and Tom McCarthy to shape the story? Wow, you knew about Ray's Barbecue. That place was fantastic. Um, Fact or fiction, you declined to participate in the Born Conspiracy video game because you wanted a game that was more like Myst. Yeah, I, yeah, wow, wow. That's, uh, no, I just didn't want to do a kind of a, just like a first person shooter. Like, they offered me a bunch of money, but it was like, if you could make it more, I don't know, if a little more thought had to go into it, or, you know, like Mist, I love that game. So I was like, <laughs> you know, more like Mist. And uh, they were like, no, and they just went and made it without me. <laughs> 
I've seen you post uh, pictures of Iberico ham in Spain, and then you were posted prosciutto in uh, Venice. What is your Mount Rushmore, your top four cured meats of all time? <laughs> your top four cured meats of all time. Wow. God damn, that is the hardest question I've ever been asked. And you saved it until we're almost done with the hottest sauces. I knew you get harder as you go. Top four cured meats. I can't even think of a single cured meat right now. I mean, I mean, like, I can't even think of a single one. Like, there was a pepperoni pizza I had, like, a million years ago that I remember was nice. I didn't know you'd be asking me, like, real questions. <laughs> So New Orleans has a lot of nicknames. The Big Easy, Paris of the South. But as an avid fisherman, my guess is the one that rings truest to you is the sportsman's paradise. When you think about all the fish that you've had to fight on the hook, is there one that you would consider a prized catch? Oh, definitely. Great question. No one has ever asked me this before. Okay, so while we were shooting Endgame and Infinity War, they had these huge lakes and ponds on their properties. So in between takes, I would go fishing. I bought an outdoor grill for my trailer, like fresh fish right there on set, which some people had a problem with until they taste the fish. Then they understood my situation. Which is the more ideal day in Rhinebeck? Is it the Sinterklaas parade in the winter or spending a day at the old Rhinebeck aerodrome in the summer? God, those are both pretty great. I'm gonna have to go with the Sinterklaas parade because it only happens once a year. You can visit the aerodrome a couple times, um, but Sinterklaas is, uh, has a very special place in, in our family's heart for sure. I would love to have you come one time. Because, uh, you know, we've been in the parade a couple times, too, so I, I, I can pull some strings for you. And you know, we got the candy store, so I'll hook you up with some hot chocolate, buddy. Get me on the float. Get me that peppermint bark. I am right there. I am right there. Do it. I was <laughs> wondering where you came up with the rhyme back. I mean, I know you're good and you do your research, but that's pretty good. That you got an edit that lives in rhyme back. That's pretty fucking great. So I know that you led your middle school to a second place finish in the 2009 Kids Lit Quiz World Finals. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then, I was like, what's this going to be? Like Battle of the Bands debut, perhaps? The literature, literature finals. Thank you finals. so much, yeah. One and, of my finest achievements, honestly. And then recently you changed your Instagram bio to be a quote by Joan Didion. Do you have a favorite literary reference from one of your songs or music videos? Hmm. That's a really good question. Definitely for this last album, something, a quote that I thought about a lot by a writer called Annie Dillard was, um, how we spend our days is, how, is of course how we spend our lives. You're an artist who seems picky about production. What are some of the non-negotiables or specific things that you look for or listen for when you're picking out a beat? You're a damn good interviewer. <laughs> um, I'll take it. I think what you grow up listening to affect the choices you make. I have certain grooves and tempos I'm attracted to that I think people can see patterns in, but I love groovy stuff. That's one thing I could say. I love things that just got more of a spin to it as opposed to like an up and down bounce. I'm, I like more of a groove, you know what I mean? Just smooth stuff. That's what I really like. As a lifelong video game junkie turned musician, how important is a game soundtrack to the overall gaming experience to you? That. Isn't a, that is that question right there, sir? That it is so so important, like Super Mario and Zelda, Contra, or like Sonic the Hedgehog. It's one of those things that's like the note choices and stuff like that. They're so important in certain moments, you know. And I don't think they should. I don't ever think they should be washed over in just the nuances of how we do stuff now, where it's like it could be cool. But that's what makes a video game amazing. This last Mario Kart was fantastic. Soundtrack was amazing. It's what will keep you there. It'll keep your mind ticking in the way that it should be, I think. Halo, you know, like Halo soundtrack has always been ridiculous, you know? I'm always curious with an actor who's as prolific as you are, is there an under the radar project that when a fan brings it up to you on the street, it maybe hits you emotionally a little bit differently? Yes, that is such a great question, by the way. That is not something that I hear often. Uh, there's a couple. Um, Over the Garden Wall is a big one. Um, it was an animated miniseries on Cartoon Network. This sort of beautiful 2D animation style that feels very much like it evokes something from the past. It's really stunning. Grand Piano, 
that still remains one of my favorite experiences working on a film. And on the production side of things, uh, I get really excited when people uh, reference The Greasy Strangler, because that is not something that many people have seen. And it's a polarizing movie. It's a movie not for everyone. And so when people are enthusiastic and have seen the movie, I get very excited. So it's clear from watching your music videos that there's a certain sentimental chord that you can hit. For example, mixing in VHS effects or cult classic horror movie references and a song like Good For You. Mm -hmm. How do you think about blending in novelty and nostalgia in your art? Oh my gosh, that's a thoughtful question. I. I've always been like such a visual artist. Like every time I hear like a song of mine, I like can like instantly like sort of picture um, like what it looks like. And I don't know, maybe that's like my style of songwriting too. But yeah, I'm really inspired by vintage things and I'm obsessed with the 90s and 90s music and 90s pop culture. And so there's definitely nods to that um, in my music, but also like I was born in 2003, it's very much a Gen Z sort of thing. So um, the, the, I mean, that, that like inevitably shows itself in everything I do. In Stillwater, you attend a game at the Velodrome and then I've seen you at Formula One events. I've seen you at rugby matches. What to you is the most memorable sporting event that you've ever seen internationally? A great question. The craziest thing I've ever seen without a doubt though, is a soccer game in Argentina. My wife's from Argentina. We went to spend Christmas there about 11, 12 years ago. Her family's team, Boca Juniors, which is a very popular team in, in uh, Buenos Aires, is, is in the, this final. And I say to my uncle, well, to her uncle, you know, hey, can we go, can we go to this game? And he gets this very serious look on his face and he's like, we can go, we can go. He says in Spanish, we can go, he goes, no women, no children. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, I thought, you know, I was going to take the kids and we were going to go to... <laughs> go to the game, yeah. Well, I saw why when we went, because we had to get through, I think, three police barricades. There was temporary fencing with barbed wire put up. I mean, it was just absolute madness. And police with riot gear outside. And if this is the, is the, the field, people were sitting here and people were sitting here, kind of like as if in the two end zones, what would be end zones of, of our football. And there was nobody sitting in the best seats, right? Because that was the distance that people could throw things and hit each other. Our team won, the other team's fans are filing out, and the trophy presentation finishes, and I say to Hector, I'm like, you know, should we go? And he goes, no, we still, we still. And it was because they needed time to get out of the neighborhood. Mm. where the stadium was and you had to give them like a 45 minute head start and then when they did let us out they actually held us in these temporary kind of cages I was like what are we waiting for now and they're like now they still need five more minutes to clear <laughs> the neighborhood I mean it was absolutely crazy like definitely the craziest sporting event I've been to as a diehard Disney fan which singing princess would make for the best feature on bad bitch music wow I've never been asked this before I mean, she wasn't a princess, but I would say Tinkerbell. She's sassy and she about her business and she don't take no shit. So as someone who didn't break character for three decades, it's been really interesting to watch you pull back the curtain for the first time in your WWE docuseries and now in this recent run of interviews. I'm sure you've been asked this before, but has the experience of knocking down that fourth wall over the last year, has it been cathartic or mostly just disorienting? You know, it's, it's a really great question. You know, I've been in the wrestling business for over 30 years, and 30 years with WWE on the 22nd. But I'm a notoriously old school guy. And, you know, talking about the business so openly, it's still, to this day, I, I'm kind of like, oh, should I, you know, I, I'm fighting that urge to, you know, to clam up and not talk about it and force myself, like, get in to tell stories, you know, and people are dying to hear this stuff. So, you know, that aspect, it's fun, but the, just the old school, the old school wrestler is, uh, is like, man, you should just go back, pull the curtain shut and, and tell everybody you're not home. But, uh, but so it's, it's been a mix of both. Veteran artists often have gripes with young rappers who aren't familiar with the catalogs of Notorious B.I.G. or Tupac. Do you feel the same way about models who don't take the time to study design houses or learn the history? Very, very smart question. Um, I'm not sure today how far 
the, what, if the models have time or make the time to do the research about the designers that they worked for. Definitely in my era, we did. We didn't have anyone in between the model and designer, so we had a much more intimate and personal relationship directly with them. Not discrediting them in any way. It's just that now there's more people there in between than before. I'm not saying the models today don't get to be close to knowing designers, but I feel like it was just more intimate before. So as a leading lady turned startup co-founder with Once Upon a Farm, I'm curious your perspective on a question that we once asked your Dude Where's My Car co-star Ashton Kutcher. Where are pitch meetings more likely to be parodies of themselves? Hollywood or Silicon Valley? Really great question. Definitely I've been in pitch meetings where everyone is talking lingo and you just feel like, do you guys get how, do you, do you get that you're a parody of yourselves? But you know, we're all in it together and so I have a laugh. But when I go to grocery store meetings and I make sales calls to different grocery stores, they talk in another language too. Don't think that they don't. They're like, you know, this could do really well in the wet wall. And I'm like, what's a wet wall? It's where they are, you know, sprinkling, spraying down produce. And it's, there's a whole other world in, of CPG. How do you think being an artist yourself might affect your perspective as a movie reviewer? Like, do you think that as someone who's had their own art dissected by music critics, do you think that you'd be more deferential to filmmakers or do you think you'd be a savage in the reviews? Huh, hell of a question. <laughs> I'd like to think that I would take my perspective with me. Sometimes when people talk negative around <clears throat> Sometimes when people talk negative about celebrities around me, or they speak on controversies and they have an opinion, it irks me because I know how that feels. So I think on a similar note, I would take that with me. With that, I would be like, I would think about what it's like to create. Because sometimes I do look at critics and I'm like, what a dickhead you are. Like, Tell the critics shut up like my show is on. Yeah, I'm like, it takes no bravery you know, to critique. Which is the better Swiss watchmaker in your opinion, AP or Patek? Uh, well, that's a good question. I mean, historically, Patek, they haven't changed the shape to take new buyers. They just keep it real and they keep it as simple as the original shape. It's like when we're talking about a Jordan 1. Right, right. You know, they still, you know, they might change some colors, they might change something, but the shape is the shape and that's what it makes it classic. But definitely AP, they do grow with the new generation, which I think is cooler too, you know? I vibe with both. Uh, we're such a talented, talented guy that knows the right questions and knows what's up with your career. So man, I'm blessed and thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. <laughs> you asked really great questions. It's a really great interview, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. You crushed it. Oh, my God. That was so fun. Such thoughtful questions. Oh, thank you.